Uh, we've had housing bubbles before, uh, quite a few, and a other kinds of asset bubbles before, right. most recently a, an oil price asset bubble. Um, this one was really quite special. Um, I want to press you a little bit on this because I'd like to get your sense of why this one was special. Why did it get so large? Um, why uh, did someone with your astute knowledge about the economy uh, not see that this was an extraordinarily different um, bubble from one we've had before? Well, I wish I could give you a good answer to that. I, I, it, 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 was a, it was really the, the granddaddy of all bubbles, and, and it affected an asset class of $22 trillion. You know, I mean, it, was, it, it hit everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, uh, Mr. McDaniel met, mentioned people refinancing. I mean, they were betting on the fact that the following year that they, they couldn't make the payments they could refinance. And, 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 of course, the figures show that by the hundreds and hundreds of billions that happened. But uh, when it gathers momentum, I, I, you know, I, the, the Internet bubble went further than I would have thought it would have. Uh, um, we did have that farm bubble in Nebraska where, you know, right. the things went crazy for a while. And, and, and the, the early Cassandras do look kind of foolish as they go along. And when your next-door neighbor is making money, mm -hmm. you know, very easy uh, by buying a second house, you know, with very small down payment, after a while uh, it sort of gets to you. And uh, maybe you figure you should be doing it too. I, it's, uh, it's been a history of bubbles. I mean, I, I never understood why tulips were worth what they were back in, you know, but the for, Netherlands. But for, for you in particular, yeah, no, and I you've had it. many years to watch our right. economy, and uh, to economists in general, rise, sharply rising prices are a signal that something is peculiarly going on in the, in the economy. Right. Well, um, I, you saw the prices rising very quickly, um, but you still didn't think that this was something that um, could eventually collapse. I didn't think it would pop like it did, no. I, I, interestingly enough, in 2005 and six, and I believe I've got the time period right, I get offered businesses for sale periodically. A significant percentage of the publicly traded home builders, one way or another, let it be known that they would like to sell out to Berkshire Hathaway. And looking back, I should have, I should have figured out uh, but I didn't figure out. <laughs> uh, were they asking more than once? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it's interesting. I never had. It, I never heard from them. You know, in, in many decades in business, and all of a sudden, three or four of them showed up on the doorstep. Uh, you were once an owner of uh, Freddie Mac, right? So uh, you are familiar with how Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac operate. Um, do uh, do you see their activities as having any role in the growth of this bubble? Well, I think they were doing <clears throat> doing what they were instructed by Congress to do to, to a great degree, but I, they took on uh, weaker forms of mortgages in greater amounts. I mean, that's been covered in some of the reports. That and so they and and they also bought. Uh, you know, they, they would require a 20% down payment, but then they would buy mortgage insurance from other entities. And I've looked at the profile of some of those loans and, and material I got from the mortgage guarantee uh, organizations. And frequently, a, very, a significant percentage of the time, more than 50% of the income of the borrower was going to mortgage payments. That's not sustainable. And, and But whereas they were laying that off with a mortgage guarantee insurance company, they were still in effect, helping people participate in something that was really, unless housing prices kept going up, was going to lead to big trouble. Why did you sell your Freddie Mac stock? <clears throat> I, I sold it for several reasons, but uh, I think we were the largest shareholders of Freddie Mac. And uh, uh, at one point, the well, it, was, it became apparent they were getting more and more entranced by, by trying to report increased earnings every quarter. And, and any financial institution that tries to do that, in my view, is going to get in trouble sooner or later. And, and they, they became quite quite interested in that particular, having that happen. Uh, they also, at Freddie, as I remember, it was either RJR bonds or Philip Morris bonds, but they bought some bonds that had nothing to do with housing at all. And here they were using what was in effect the government's credit to enlarge the size of this hedge fund type portfolio, now with some corporate bonds that had nothing to do with housing. And I just figure if you see one cockroach, there's probably a lot.
more in, um, in the kitchen. Did, did, uh, did you follow Fannie and Freddie enough to know that they had affordable housing requirements? Uh, oh, sure, yeah. And uh, did you know the, the size of those affordable housing requirements? Yeah, and, and of course, <clears throat> they were predicated on being able to use the tax credits that, that, that uh, were involved, and they set them up as assets on their balance sheet, and of course they have no income now, so, so those, those became very dubious assets. But uh, were, you, were you aware then that they were buying the kinds of mortgages that they were buying in order to comply with the aff affordable housing requirements that they Well, I certainly knew they were. Yeah, they, 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 were <clears throat> they were mandated in many of their activities by Congress, uh, no question about that. And they were also trying to serve Wall Street, and that's a, that's a tough balancing act. Uh, how much time do I have left? <laughs> Four minutes and 51 seconds. Okay. Um, <laughs> you are quite famous for saying, um, among other things, and this isn't the only thing you're famous for, but you said that uh, credit default swaps are financial instruments of mass destruction, and yet it's recently come to light that you actually participate actively in that market. Yeah, I, I, I think I actually said derivatives are, are financial, uh, potentially, and, and, and I think that used improperly, as they almost are certain to be, uh, because of what they provide people to trade in them and what they provide in the way of increased leverage that's not obtainable uh, in other ways, <clears throat> I think that they have, they pose system-wide problems. And, and what, do you, what do you use them for? Uh, I use them to make money. Uh, <laughs> if, I, if I think they're mispriced, I buy them. Uh, but you are, these are credit default swaps or other kinds no, of... No, we've, we've never bought a credit default swap. We've sold credit default swaps. Yes. We sell... You sell, we sell protection. insurance. You sell protection. We sell insurance. The protection side. Yeah, well, we sell it on municipal bonds. We sell it, yeah, on corporate. And corporates. then do you, do you lay that off? No. Do you, uh, you do not no. hedge that? No, I never lay it off. So you do... Uh, we sell insurance. Uh, this is much like what AIG did, right? They didn't well, I lay don't off. I don't think it's much like it. But, <laughs> 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 but, but we, sell, no, we sell credit insurance. No, we sell, we sell auto insurance, and AIG sold auto insurance, too. I mean... <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have no further questions. I, I Thanks very much. Could I bring up one point in sure. connection with it? Because it gets back to a point that was made earlier about the laws getting on the books and never getting changed. If you go back to the 19, late 1920s, we had a bubble then. It was in stocks, and it was partly caused by extreme margin by people that really didn't know what they were doing, 10% margins. And they had commission hearings after that, and they decided that, that this was a societal problem, uh, and Congress gave to the Federal Reserve the authority to regulate margins, and they said this is important. The Federal Reserve still has that authority, as I understand it, you know, 70 plus years later. What we put in derivatives and total return swaps, you know, at that point you could borrow 100% of what you own. And so we sit here with a system, and I brought this up a half a dozen times, and sometimes with people in Congress, and I say, what in the world are we doing when we say the Federal Reserve should have margin requirements, which I believe now are 50%, and you can go to a, and get a total return swap and borrow 100%, or you can buy S&P index futures with a tiny percentage down. I mean, it is, it is something that should be addressed. I, I, thought, I thought your, maybe I misread this in the newspapers, but I thought your problem with uh, some of the legislation that is going through had to do with the fact that you didn't want to put up the collateral, which substitutes well, in for the margin. Well, in, in terms of, in terms of, Contracts that were negotiated several years ago, there was one price for collateralized contracts right. and another price for uncollateralized. We simply, and, and incidentally, Coca-Cola, Anheuser-Busch, thousands of companies negotiated under that basis. We say if we're required to substitute an uncollateralized contract and, and make it a collateralized contract, before we send that money to Wall Street, we should get paid for the difference in those two types of, of, of contracts because they are two different contracts, just like changing the price or changing the maturity. And there's a, a, norm, there's a very significant difference in price. And not only we, but hundreds of end users would be required to send money to Wall Street firms uh, contrary to the contract they originally uh, negotiated and contrary to the price differential that existed between those two types of contracts. So you don't have any objection to doing it in the future as long, when you use it? Oh, no, no, not in the least. If I don't, you're, I, if I you're don't even object to I, I just don't, I, I object to selling one kind of a contract and having changed into another kind of a contract without getting paid. <laughs> okay, thank you.